uh, we have a great evening, like I said, um, that's in store for us today. Thanks, David, for starting that recording. Um, and uh, we have a few guests that will be joining us. I'll ask them uh, very quickly to introduce themselves. But uh, if you join us for the first time, let me just let you know what we're doing. Uh, we, because we're in Heritage Month and we want to really ce celebrate the diversity of our country, but obviously celebrate it in, in the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. What we want to do uh, uh, in this month and do tonight is really try and figure out um, what does it look like to be a Christian? Uh, and uh, no matter what culture I'm from, whether it's Zulu, uh, whether I'm, Africa, I'm an Africana or African speaking, um, and so the tagline for our, our whole series has been, does Jesus cancel my culture? And this is really what we want to talk about now. Now, the, one of the first things I'd like to do is just to introduce our, our guests, um, for three people that are joining us today, for Sihle and David and, uh, and Johan. I'm just going to ask them to introduce themselves, uh, where are they from, what do they do, um, do they have a family of their own, and then we will get going uh, for the evening. Let me start with Sihle. Sihle, do you want to kick us off, brother? Uh, th thanks, bro. Um, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, my name is Sihle Kulu. Um, I'm originally from, from, from Durban. Uh, so I spent half of my life in Durban, but also in Benoni. So sort of half Durbanite and Benoni, if, if, that, if there's a word like that. Um, um, I'm, I'm married to Letabo. We have two kids. Uh, and I'm currently in, in Motorfontaine, in the Edenvale area. That's where I stay. And I'm part of the church plant there. I lead a team uh, planting a church in, in that area. Um, that'll be sort of the short of it. And probably later we'll get to more uh, broader aspect of my life. Yeah. Thanks, thanks bro. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Johan, uh, do you want to uh, join also and just share about your life? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Yuan is, is my name. Uh, it's not a very creative name. Most Afrikaans people are Yuan. And as a matter of fact, David, David was looking for another Yuan, um, and I was just rent the Afrikaner uh, when that Yuan couldn't attend the meeting. So, uh, but in any case, I, my, my name is Yuan Erasmus, and uh, I'm here in Pretoria, where I'm part of a, a small church community called Dialogue. And uh, I'm, I'm also part of an NGO called Beter Eindes, or the, uh, our Zulu name is uh, Skoko Sangampela. And I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a different story uh, that we have over there, but it's, it's sort of social development and trying to get the Afrikaners on board in terms of uh, you know, moving this country forward. And uh, I shouldn't have left this to the last, uh, the last bit, but I also have a wife who's uh, behind that wall and uh, <laughs> baby of six months old and uh and so if you hear you know stuff in the background it's not because i'm angry or uh it's it's just my culture uh, which includes a six month old baby so yeah and thanks for the for the invitation even if you guys were looking for another yuan it's lucky to be here <laughs> good to have you hon uh great to have you with us here today uh david Kluter, do you want to jump in as well brother Hi everyone, my name is uh, David, David Tutor. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, from the Northern Cape, moved to Cape Town, live and stay here, married to my beautiful wife, Onga Ziwe. We have one daughter, uh, so you won't hear any noise. Um, uh, church brother was gracious enough to, because I was in the area to, <laughs> so you won't hear any babies in the background. At the moment, not part of my culture. Uh, but yeah, so my name is David Kluter. I work for uh, an organization called Ismambara Center for Biblical Justice. Uh, and I'm also involved in the Student Y uh, campus ministry, probably more full time. That's my main uh, ministry that I'm involved in on campus doing student ministry. Uh, and then, yeah, also uh, joined a wonderful Christian brother uh, here in Cape Town, planning a church by the name of Wesley Marshall. Uh, I'm excited for that work. Um, yeah, that's what I do. Um, and yeah, that's where I'm from. I'm from the Northern Cape, moved to Cape Town. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I guess you guys now have a bit of an understanding of who they are. Uh, if you hear any kids in my background as well, uh, it's part of my culture, as you've heard of and again. Uh, so 
So what I will do just to start off our evening is I'd like to define what we mean by culture uh, so that uh, we are on the same page. I think it will be helpful to do that uh, so that uh, uh, people aren't in too many places as we have this conversation uh, together. Let me read a few definitions for us of what culture is and then I'll explain what, uh, what direction we're taking tonight. Uh, listen to this definition. A few of them are from the dictionary. Uh, here's the very first one. The customary beliefs are social norms and material traits of an ethnic, religious, or social group. Second one is uh, the set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that make up a group. Uh, third one, this I took from uh, a sociology uh, website, uh, a sociology and anthropology website, and this is how they define culture. Patterns of land and shared behaviors and beliefs of a particular social, ethnic, or age group. Thus, culture includes many societal uh, aspects, such as language, customs, values, norms, mores, rules, tools, technologies, uh, products, organizations, and institutes. Uh, so there's a shared interpretation or understanding of the world. Um, some of the definitions I've come across talk about culture, even within a particular group, as being varied and also dynamic. And dynamic, they mean uh, it changes uh, and it improves uh, 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 for uh, the better. Now, as we talk about culture today, I, I want to say you can find people that are from a, like different ethnic backgrounds that speak different languages that are part of one culture in a sense. And that's a broad definition of what culture would mean by culture. But today we're not really looking at it in that broad sense. We're thinking about it in terms of um, someone who speaks a particular language, has particular cultural norms, and so on and so on. Uh, so we're looking at it from a perspective of Reggie being Christian and Kosa. So what does it mean for Reggie to be uh, Christian and Kosa? What does it mean for Sikha to be uh, Christian and Zulu, for David to be Christian and Khalid, and, um, and uh, Johan to be Christian and Afrikaans or an Afrikaner? Um, so that's the direction we're taking today. But the very first thing I'd like to do is just uh, share a quote, I'll read it, and I'll ask the gentleman who've joined us to, to just engage with the coach, um, with the quote. Uh, uh, the quote defines culture in a both bro broad and I think, for lack of a better word, narrow sense. And I'm just gonna ask them, what do they agree with um, uh, from, from the quote and what do they disagree with? Uh, this is a quote from a, a seminary that has just released a statement on, on culture and um, justice and many other things. But I'm just gonna read the, uh, the quote for us and I'm just gonna post it up as well uh, so that uh, you are able to follow uh, with me. So let me post the, co the, the quote up so that you can see it there. Let me read it for us. We affirm that culture is an extension of religion. A culture is the incarnation of a worldview and its beliefs about ultimate questions. We further affirm that cultures more deeply influenced by Christianity will be more God honoring than cultures influenced by unbelief and idolatry. And I will stop there. What do you guys think of uh, this quote right here? What do you agree with the quote and what do you disagree uh, uh, with it? Any one of you can just uh, pick up and, uh, and start off. Hmm. Uh, Reg, I think, <laughs> so with everything, um, there's always truth and there's always probably error in, every, in everything that human beings do. Um, and so we, we probably need scripture to help us in, in every way. And we all have cultural lenses through which we interpret certain things and appropriate certain concepts. Um, so I'd say, broadly speaking, there's probably some, some things that I would affirm, but, but probably not everything in the quote. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, is, is, is that where you're going to stop, Dave? Or yeah, for now. That's, 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 that's where I'm going to stop. Okay, that's cool. That's Sorry. Cool. Um, let's, let's hear the other gents. Um, I will. I will say the same with with David. Like, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm trying to 
to get exactly what the court sort of meant by that, to say that, I think it's saying there are cultures that are more influenced, or the cultures that are more influenced by the gospel are more glorifying to God. Um, or the culture is the extension, extension of religion or something like that. I think it, it, it's, there's a lot there. And some of it, I'm like, mm. uh, I sort of get where it's going um, because I feel like the, the gospel comes, is this announcement of the, 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 the Messiah that comes outside of our cultural norms um, or, or whatever that the, the culture is defined. And I, and I don't think, uh, and, and mixing it, uh, that's sort of where the, the problem starts. Um, and I think whether it's, it's, you know, different cultures or cultures that have been influenced by the gospel, whatever that, that means, uh, we should always look at it in a, in a different way. The gospel is coming in into a certain context, which is that culture. Um, yeah, and, and with that, there's, there are good things that, that, that the, um, there are good things there and there are bad things that the gospel will challenge. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that they're, they're sort of, uh, there are cultures that are more synonymous with the gospel, so to speak. But again, I think that the quote has a lot of it and, and yeah, maybe we can unpack it as we go, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I didn't find the quote you know, particularly inspiring or uninspiring. You know, it's, it's, uh, what, what I will say is, is this, that uh, I think it's dangerous to talk about Christian culture and the reason why I think it's dangerous to talk about Christian culture is that uh, the, the, the Bible belt or the Republican way of, of thinking of, of themselves, it's very much, much a Christian culture, or at least that's how they define themselves. But it's also a culture where you know, they're very passionate about guns. And I'm sorry if I offend you know, somebody with those political um, orientations, but uh, it, it becomes this, this, this subculture. And... Um, so, so, so I think that's something that we can be a little bit hesitant about, is just talking about a Christian culture. I think it's something worth aspiring to, uh, but just because it's got that label does not mean that, that we can be comfortable. Uh, that's the one thing. The second thing is that I think uh, we are underselling God if we think that a culture can only be influenced directly by the gospel presentation. Now, I'm very passionate about the gospel. But, um, you know, when we talk about general revelation, it means that cultures, you know, throughout the world would have had some form of, of bearing the image of God, even, even before the gospel came to them. Um, so, so maybe that's just another point worth noting, is that uh, there are, and, and it, 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 therefore, when the gospel comes, one doesn't need to necessarily disregard everything in that culture, because by virtue of being made in the image of God, certain uh, approaches of theirs would have been God honoring. Um, the, the, the one thing that I like about the Christian approach is it's, it's always been incarnational. So um, culture is not ultimate for us, uh, but it is, it is legitimate. And that's why Christianity, in terms of the bigger world religions, has this capability of of, of really incarnating in a particular area. And we see this through architecture. So to pick on the Muslims, if you look at a mosque, it always looks the same, no matter where you are. Um, if you think of the Quran, it's always in Arabic, no matter where you are. But Christianity, you've got the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek, later written in Latin, later into many different languages. A church looks different in Ethiopia, than Egypt, in Turkey. And I think that is because the Bible is actually quite passionate about you know, culture and how they, how they mix, how they incarnate, because our central story is effectively a God coming into our world and, and incarnating into this world, which, which is actually a massive plus. It's, it's saying it's giving a massive thumbs up to, to a lot of our cultural activities. Sorry for going on that long. That, that was very helpful, uh, uh, gentlemen. Thanks, Johan, for that. And I think, um, I'm just on the same page with you guys. I definitely agree that there is quite, um, uh, there are things in the quotes that, uh, that I'm agreeable with. And I'm like, I, I definitely see uh, where they're going with that. But I think something that you touched on, Johan, is, is the exclusion of, of, of God's common grace is something that, uh, that made me think, perhaps there's more that can be said than, than simply that. 
Um, and I mean, so I, I just came across a few scholars and there's one, um, well, philosopher, I, one of them was talking about how when he's viewed the world, he can definitely tell uh, how in terms of um, the way that the world thinks of freedom, the way the world thinks of rights, the way the world thinks of democracy is something that has been influenced by Christianity. Um, but it was interesting to hear the very same people then saying, uh, but it's amazing how they've also seen God's grace, uh, his common grace towards his people, actually helping people that do not know Jesus uh, to actually live in such a way that that, that models um, uh, something of what God intended for his creation in the beginning. So let me just read a few quotes to just help us with that, the understanding of common grace, so that we are just on the, on the same page with that. Let me read to you what... Um, now, let me explain what I mean by common grace, because uh, uh, Johan uh, used that phrase for us, common grace or general grace. Uh, so the Bible, or in, in the field of Christianity, there is what is called special grace, and there we're referring to um, the message, of course, of the gospel in Jesus Christ, the message of salvation for us. And then there's common grace. And in common grace, there we're talking about God's sustenance of his creation, um, whether people are Christian or not, and there's a great quote I actually came across um, from an article from the Institute of Faith, Work and Ethics. And listen to what this guy says. This is the third reason he talks about why God shows common grace uh, towards his creation. He says the third reason why God has given common grace is that through common grace, God bestows his blessing, both physical and spiritual, on all mankind, including those who reject Christ. And furthermore, this is what he says. And here he quotes a guy called John Murray. And he says, God does not restrain, does not just restrain evil in unredeemed men, but he gives them gifts and talents and allows them to work for the protection and promotion of right, uh, the preservation of liberty, the improvement of physical and moral conditions. So basically for the goodwill of others. And a bit later, he mentions something, uh, another quote. He says, how is it then that men who are not uh, savingly renewed by the Spirit of God, uh, nevertheless exhibit, exhibit so many qualities, gifts, and accomplishments that promote the preservation, the temporal happiness, cultural progress, social and economic improvement of themselves and others. So again, there you see this understanding of how God and His common grace actually has influenced our world. And as we talk about now these different cultures that we come from, we want to think about that, like what is it in our culture can we embrace? because we see in God's common grace is something that's good, something that we can use to glorify God. And what is it in our culture that needs to be redeemed and we can still use it for God's glory? And what is it in our culture that we can, um, we can outwardly reject because it does not uh, bring God glory in any way. So let's, let's start with that gentlemen. Let's hear uh, what is it that from your cultures, because all of you have different stories. What is it from your culture that you have embraced? If I can go first. Um, okay, let me let me go. Uh, I think it'd be good to give some sort of a context with, with regards to my culture and where just where I come from with this issue, because I think it'd be helpful. Um, so as I said, I'm 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 from Durban. That means, well, you know, not everyone in Durban is Zulu, but most people in, in Durban are Zulu. So I'm Zulu, and that that'd be my 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 sort of my culture, my. Uh, tribe, uh, so to speak, um, and I grew up in a family that was, um, you know, my my. So I grew up on sort of knowing my my mother's side. So I grew up in in a, in a single mom household. Uh, so I I grew up with uncles and and my mom's sisters and and um, yeah that type that side of the family, and they were, I would say, I mean, so there were many, maybe like thirteen of them, my aunts and 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 uncles. And they were sort of divided into uh, Christians. Maybe four or five of them were Christians. They got saved and, and, and the rest of them were not saved. And they're more in, like into politics and, 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 and some of them not sort of in the indifferent about stuff. Um, but what was interesting, just looking at this and growing up, uh, with those who were, who were saved, they were saved uh, from, I mean, th through uh, a very strong Pentecostal tradition. And at that time, I mean, they were, they were saved in probably the 80s or so. 
um, if not earlier. Uh, and the way that Christianity was presented to them, it was, you know, you get saved and you drop everything that resembles your culture. Um, and you drop everything that resembles, and everything that, resemb that talks about politics or that engages the world. Um, so I grew up in a family with, with my mom where we, we didn't, I mean, we, we, we hardly even listen to cultural music or music in, 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 in my Zulu culture. We didn't engage in, in family practices that, that were cultural in any way. Uh, so there was just that. And then you have my, my other uncles or other aunts who were more political than that. So there was this clash of, it's either you're a Christian and you drop everything, or they don't want that. They want to withhold their culture and who they are, and therefore they won't be Christian. Um, so there was, there was that tension, even as I grew up, uh, which made me really struggle with Christianity to say, man, how, how do I live that? Because I could see the tension in the house where, since, you know, we have umsebenzi, which is like we, we do like a celebration or, or some cultural thing for, for uh, maybe for someone who's passed on or whatever. And then my mom and other side of the family, they're not going, the others are going, there's that clash. Um, so when I, when, so when, when I became a Christian, that was something that I really had to think about to say, you know, how does really the gospel speak into this? Um, and where do I stand about this? And so it was something that I really need, needed to think about and, and sort of uh, wrestle with it on my own. And, and, and at the beginning, I sort of went with the flow. I mean, I didn't know much. I didn't know even much about the, the Bible. My Bible handling was, was not that great. And, and, and even the church context I was in, um, so there was a I sort of fell into the to the to the place where my mother and other uncles were in, you know. So that I rejected everything, but then later I sort of just understood, man. Actually, this is, you know, there's, there's no mistake that I'm who I'm the person that I am. That I'm black. That I'm I'm Zulu, uh, you know. But at the same time, the gospel is able to come to me as this person. Um, and therefore, there's a sense that um, I should be able to express my beliefs and I express my love for Jesus in, in, in my cultural space, in, in, in who I am. Um, so there were things that I was like, actually, I'm thinking maybe that's, I mean, there are things that, that I, I still struggle with even now, um, just because of the way we do church, the way we, we do a lot of things that are, are more some of the some of the stuff is not culturally, uh, you know, it's not it's not embraced in a Christian way. Like, let me use an example. Like, let's say, um, in my Zulu culture, the way we sing in my Zulu culture, there's a lot of music. When when we gather, when there's family stuff, whatever, there's a lot of people gathering around the kraal or or whatever we're doing, we are singing, and the way we sing. It's very different. Now, maybe some people have heard uh, President Zuma. He, he, he'll be, I mean, former President Zuma, he'll be in a, you know, people and he'll be singing Zulu songs. That's a Zulu uh, sort of form of singing, you know, so sorry to, 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 to scare some people. But I'm just trying to, to show that, that our culture has that. But that's very foreign to Christianity. Christianity you know, you grow up in a box setting with regards to music. Oh, Maria. I'm just, I'm singing, but I'm just sort of using examples. And that on its own is something that it's hard to bring together to say, Here, here's the cultural form that I, that I grew up in, that I know that is it's part of me, but I get into this space that this is not, it's not part of it. It's shunned, it's, it's, you don't do that, you live that at home. Um, but to answer your question, and I think I was sort of giving a context. So I'll, to answer your question, I'll say I've, I've, I've embraced probably the, 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 the music aspect of my culture. I will say broadly, like Ubuntu, we'll talk about Ubuntu to say like uh, we, we, the values that we love one another, the sense of community um, that I've embraced, that sense of community, the sense of um, I mean, I, you know, I, I was speaking with some friends recently who, who, who and we were talking about adoption and, and, and things like that. I was like, wait, actually, actually, like in my culture, we've never grew up, we never grew up talking about, you know, adoption because 
because there's a sense that children in, a, in, in, in our community or in a village or whatever, they were never on their own. You know, there was always a sense of they are part of, the, they are part of all of us. Uh, we grew up that the whole street you know, it has, it speaks into my life, you know, whether I'm in the township or whether in, in that space. So that communal aspect I've, I've embraced and I continue to embrace. Um, and, and, and other aspects, yeah, just cultural stuff, whether it's music, whether it's, it's clothing, whether it's all of the stuff that, that I was told that you, you can't do this, you can't wear this, you can't sing like this, you can't do all of these things that I've sort of embraced right now. Um, and obviously some of the stuff that I, I still reject and, and, and uh, some of the stuff that I reject, but I just leave what I've embraced for now, yeah. Mm, mm. Uh, thanks for that, Sisha. Um, let, let's hear Dave, David. Uh, do you want to share it? Um, some of the stuff that I've embraced for my culture? Yeah, please just share your backstory as well, because that was uh, part of the thinking as well. Just okay. uh, for David, so that we, we really get that. Okay, so culturally, uh, as, a, as a colored person, um, I think um, uh, I can't, like anybody can't speak for everybody when you speak about, you know, your people. <laughs> uh, but I think within my culture and my people, there's a, there's a very unique sense in which uh, our cultures differ from region to region, from province to province. Uh, if, you, mm -hmm. if you are from, from my province, from the Northern Cape, you, you find probably more of a um, traditional African uh, expression of of our culture and 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 who we are as a people, as as colored people. Whereas if you go into uh, into Cape Town, there's probably more a stronger cultural expression and what people would call culture uh, from Malay Cape Malay people and uh, some of their foods they eat and some of the the way they carry themselves and some of the things that they that they do traditionally. Um, Whereas generally other colored people would um, express themselves quite differently, probably more Western, but there's something also that comes with language because our, 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 our Afrikaans is not the same as Johan's Afrikaans. Uh, so some people will talk of Afrikaans. Uh, now I, I, uh, my sisters are born in Cape Town. They, they speak Afrikaans. Uh, I'm from the Northern Cape. So my Afrikaans has clicks in it. So it's, it's completely different. Um, uh, uh, and that's just because um, we have strong cultural heritage or background coming from probably the indigenous people, Khoisan, Nama people, Damaras. Uh, and so with that, when I think about my upbringing, um, I always joke about this, but we used to go and hunt. Uh, we used to take a couple of dogs, we used to make our own uh, sort of uh, weapons, when I call them that, uh, things, and we would go and hunt, and and that would be that would be a that would be a meal for for the day. That would be a meal for not that we needed to, but it was something that was part of who we are and what what kids do for fun, uh, and what everybody else did. Um, so culturally, that's 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 part of how we expressed ourselves. Um, um, some of the things that I definitely. Uh, I think look up to, and I, and I probably want to speak also to this idea of, of the quote that you, you read earlier. I think there's a, there's a, there's a distinction. I think there's a, there's a massive distinction about when you talk about people's culture and you talk about the gospel influencing um, a, a society, um, mm -hmm. which may not touch on issues of culture in my, in my own thinking, um, in the way people express themselves and carry themselves. Um, uh, you can, the gospel can influence people's morality, idolatry, and the way they worship. I'm thinking, um, if you think of my people in terms of how we express ourselves culturally, uh, lots of people, there's amongst these colored people, my people, there's in the Northern Cape, we still practice ancestral worship. Um, we speak to the dead. Um, uh, and, it, and it didn't help in many ways that the Catholic Church is probably one of the strongest churches in the province in the Namako region where I'm from. It's one of these, if not the strongest church amongst colored people in the region there. And, uh, you know, with the veneration of saints and, and all these things, that stuff has been incorporated into our way of life. And so people don't see a problem if we can pray to St. Paul, 
uh, I can go and speak to my dead cousin. Um, and people see no, no fault with that. Or, uh, for example, when, when my uncle fell sick, uh, because we believe in witchcraft, when my uncle fell sick, my, uh, my, uncle fell sick, my, my, my grandparents went to, to church and asked, seeking for, for, for the priest to have guidance and help things. When he didn't get well through prayers, we went to the Sangoma and was a colored person. We went to the local town, Sangoma person, and he, she came and she did some rituals, things that we all had to drink. Uh, we believe in topologies. <laughs> um, and all of that stuff is sort of synchronized into our expression as a people and also our form of Christianity. Um, yeah, so it's, it, there's, a, there's, a whole lot of, there's a whole lot there. Um, but I think culturally, um, that's, I'd probably say, Koi San Nama people. That's that's how I would identify myself. Um, part of my heritage, part of my people. Uh, there's a lot of that that I've that I've as, as, a, as a consequence of my conversion, um, as a consequence of the gospel that I no longer embrace. But in terms of the way that we carry ourselves, apart from the religious aspect, there's there's the communal aspect that I love about my people. There's the there's the the fact that. Uh, spoke about this. We don't think of adoption because if somebody's, um, you know, if 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 a, if a child is 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 his parents, he lost both parents or whatever. Uh, everybody understands that that child needs to be taken care of by either a community member in the family or somebody within, within within the within the family. I love the hierarchy structural thing within our family. My grandmother was a was a was a was somebody that the community. From the church side as well as from the communal side that they looked up to uh, and she would often be called to perform certain rituals uh, go and pray for certain family members or, or, or people in the community and uh, she would raise uh, kids in the community not officially adopting the child but everybody understood that you take care of of, of so and such and such as kids because you have a, a, a or you are closer to the family and you may not even be blood related to to that family Another interesting thing about people in, in the Northern Cape is that um, my Amakluta, if you're in the Northern Cape, if you've ever been there amongst the people, you'll discover that uh, like just in my own street where I grew up, there were 20 other families with my surname. None of us are related whatsoever. None of us are related whatsoever. Uh, that speaks also of our history uh, as a people um, being descendants of, of, of slaves, um, uh, where we got our surname and that kind of thing from, um, but in that there is a there's a there's a there's a there's something different from your from our from my black crosser Zulu Peli, uh, uh, you name it African brothers in that they associate with that in terms of clan, whereas we don't necessarily associate in Northern Cape that with clan, but there is an affinity with the surname in that there's a tightness with people of the surname in that we take care of each other as though we are clad, but it's un unspoken. It's, 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 not, it's not something that's there, but it's there. Uh, and as you're probably listening to me, you're probably thinking, ah, this guy is black, he's not colored. No, 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 I'm colored. Um, but that's just, that's just the beauty of, 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 um, of my heritage and, uh, and, and, and the way we express ourselves culturally. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's um... clan, I can see that for <laughs> Johan, do you want to jump in now? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, I, I guess the, the typical stereotypes um, is that we are uh, we are all racist and we all own a farm, and uh, we've got notoriously bad fashion sense. The men and uh, the men are ridiculously ugly in comparison to the pretty African women. Uh, so. We, we've got those things, but, but maybe, I mean, I can, I can talk about uh, quite a bit, but maybe something that I can zoom in in terms of a, a cultural background is on, on the one hand, white people in general, and now I'm, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm including English uh, South Africans as well. Uh, we, we don't really see ourselves as having a culture. Um, this is more true for the, the English South Africans than for the Afrikaners, but um, we, we don't see ourselves as having a culture. Um, we see it as normal. 
and and maybe that's part of the reason why we're having this discussion and why uh, you know there's been a backlash as of late is because of the normativity of certain things that we didn't regard as cultural practices we just regarded it as that's the way things are um and and that's 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 interesting that's something that a lot of white people are wrestling with because um you know you you are being it, it seems like a particular idea is being attacked but um we think that this is just the way things are this is just the way things work and we don't necessarily regard it as cultural so there are certain things that we need to unlearn and, and learn there in terms of my Afrikaner story the one narrative that, that might not be available to you guys that much is a victimhood narrative so uh, you know many people think that the, you know uh, what, what what is the perpetrator like you one doing in, in a discussion like this but the Afrikaners I mean very few Afrikaners see themselves as perpetrators very few perpetrators in the world see themselves as perpetrators that's that's just how it works we see ourselves as victims like many other cultures in the world and the reason why we see ourselves as victim is that it, since you are a very very uh, young young child in Afrikaners uh, in an Afrikaans household you will learn about um, the concentration camps and what the English did to our people and you know I remember watching rugby as a little kid and you know there with my dad and I said I'm supporting the white side not referring to race so don't kick me off yet referring to England with the white jerseys and um, and but, but I, I just walked in saw this on the screen and said I, I support the white side and they were playing the All Blacks and my dad said no you're not allowed to I said why am I not allowed to, to support the, the guys with the white jerseys uh, no, because they killed your grandfather and grandmother in the concentration camps, which is factually false because my grandmother and grandfather were still alive. But that sentiment is is there that, you know, it, it, the concentration camps, this is what the English did to the Afrikaner. So, you know, I grew up having more beef with English or the English than with anybody else. And, uh, you know, stories of how you would... Uh, go to a Milner school. So these are the, the Pretoria Boys High and you know, these, these fancy schools. And if you spoke Afrikaans in the class, they will put this donkey suit on you and you will, you will be the donkey for the day. And just the humiliation that, that Afrikaners experienced at the hands of, of the English. Now, uh, there's no doubt some truth to that. There's also no doubt that this has been exaggerated by Afrikaner nationalism. We don't remember that well as humans. So, you know, when we want to push a particular ideology, we, we, we crank it up a bit. But there's some truth to it. I mean, there, there, there was some genuine oppression. But that victimhood story is, 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 very, uh, is very much part of the Afrikaner. And, and then, the, the, that's the negative part. The, the positive part is, um, but we built something. You know, was it gebouw? Even if you look at Solidariteit or Afriforum adverts, it always has the word bow in, you must build. And, you know, we love telling ourselves stories of, you know, the English, they built UCT, but we built Stellenbosch. And sooner or later, you know, we beat them with their own games, you know, with rugby and cricket. And, um, you know, they have wits, but we build um, the Ramsa Afrikaanse Universiteit, you know, uh, what UJ used to be, and Tikkis and uh, Kofsis, you know, and all these, these institutions. They have Pretoria Boys Eye, we have Afis, and, and we competed and we were better. Than, than them. So that, that, that victim story and how we build stuff um, is, is very much part of the Afrikaner culture. And, and part of that is very much a fighting mentality. So, so you know, many people say that Afrikaners are very aggressive. And it's, it, it might be true um, that, that there's something very stubborn, you know, not unlike the Zulus, but, but something very uh, very aggressive in our dominion. I, I think it's because the stories that we tell ourselves even today is very much one, you know, based on fear, but based on we need to fight ourselves out of this. And um, and, and, and these are our thoughts. I'm, I'm not the best Afrikaner. You, you guys could have got, gotten a better Afrikaner here tonight. But um, so it's not like I'm, I, I listen to Afrikaans music or you know, uh, watch Afrikaans films. You know, that doesn't necessarily float my boat. But uh, the point is that these these things um, happen to you if you're an Afrikaner. You are taught. Um, we were victimized and we built ourselves up. Um, so, so, so these stories have a massive impact on us, whether good or bad. 
I'm, I'm, I'm not making the, the verdict there. I'm just saying that this is, you know, very much part of the, uh, the Afrikaner story. Johan? So, uh, so what do you feel from your culture? Have you embraced? Uh, um, so similar thing to what the, the, the gents have said. Um, so I don't know, if, um, are you able to share on that? I can jump in and share yeah, sure. just from yeah. that as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so in terms of, of, of embracing uh, certain elements, you know, the, the Afrikaner, there is something resilient about the Afrikaner. Um, that I think one can celebrate. And, yeah. and also there's an attachment to the land. To the, you know, that's why we, we, we call ourselves Afrikaners. We, we call ourselves Afrikaners and then put you know, little signs up saying European only, but God knows the logic. But there, there, is, there is some uh, attachment to the land and a resilience in the Afrikaner that I think we can celebrate. So in the Anglo-Boer War, which is, remember, our, that's our struggle. That's, that's, that's how it's, it's entrenched into our minds, uh, or I should say the South African War. Uh, we, the guys who refused to give up against the English were called the bitter Enders, meaning that they fought till the bitter end. They refused to give up. And mm. that idea of, of fighting to the bitter end, there's something... Uh, there's something good about it. That's even why we have our name. We don't have an English name. Maybe we still have beef with the English. I don't know. But um, our, our, our name is Bieter Einders, saying instead of fighting to the bitter end, let's, let's fight. I'm talking about my NGO now. Um, uh, we, we should fight to the better end. But how we try to incorporate that into you know, a bigger thinking in, in, a, in the South African space is to say it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like Skoko, Sangampela. So the way I understand it is that the the, the score cause, um, you know, that's the, the, the pup that was burnt to the to the bottom of the, the, the pot. And the young impies, uh, they were the guys who put their hands in there. They would eat that that bit. And they were tough guys. Even when things get hot, they're not running away. They, they would eat the pup. And, and, and that's something that I think, and definitely I want to really push Afrikaners to, to do is to say, you know, we said that we, we're fighting till the bitter end, and that's the story we've been telling ourselves ever since the South African War, ever since the, the English, the Anglo War. But let's let's still keep to that ideal of fighting till the bitter end, but for a better end. All right. I think our we must become bigger. But that resilience, there's there's something there that, that I think we can appreciate. And also something that my uh, sorry that I'm going on this long, but something that my black friends appreciate about Afrikaners is, um, you know, we, we're not good actors, so we don't pretend well. So there's something honest about Afrikaners. So, you know, they, they might be racist, but you're going to know they're racist. And they might um, be a good guy or a bad guy, but you're going to know it because we, we're not good at pretending. So what you see is what you get. Again, there's something positive in that that I think one can, can embrace. Mm. Mm. So thanks for that, uh, Johan. Thanks, uh, David and Sikha. Um, If you missed what they said, I think one of the things that really stuck out for me, especially about what Johan said, is that whole um, persistent uh, and wanting to fight to, to the better end. I think especially when you think of our country, it would be great that you see more people who, who do embrace that kind of, um, I think, a trait. And it's good to hear that. And it's good to hear the guys sharing, sharing. Of, uh, of embracing the communal aspect of their cultures, whether it's music and other things as well. Now, I wanted to share from my own experience as well, um, but I think uh, because we've invited these guys and I don't want to take too much time, um, uh, I'll be quick on it. And I'll actually, I'll actually share on the conversation as well I had with a friend yesterday. Um, so we were talking and we went, so as we were talking, we were also talking about how things we've seen in our culture that have in, in a sense, being influenced by Christianity and have become part of our culture in, in one sense. So we were both talking about how when someone has lost a loved one, um, having, a serve, having something such as Melinda or, or you call it a Virgil or uh, a time of prayer and singing together is something that, as we were talking to yesterday, he was saying to me, man, I miss that. I miss, I mean, he was clear that one, he understands that people grieve differently, 
but what he really enjoyed from his background, so he's Zulu, and he said what he enjoyed about uh, uh, his background then is that you would have people who would help you to keep your eyes on Jesus, even as you, as you, as you go through a time of grief. And I was, I, was quite, I was quite amazed by that to see. Man, there's so many things that we can uh, adopt. Um, I mean, we had a conversation as well about Lobola and how Lobola brings families together. Um, and families, and the families are able to say, hey, um, you've taken our daughter and our family has been brought together. And this, this is a gift that's been given to our family. And that as Christians, that's something we can say. I mean, this is good. Uh, this is something that can be embraced. Spent a lot of time talking about that as well. And I think the third thing we spoke about related to bereavement as well, was how you've got people in whatever culture you come, uh, come from. So he's Zulu Amkosa. You always had people that would come whenever you've lost a loved one. And some of them will be there with you, not so much to share words of encouragement, but they'll be there. Your family will travel very far to just spend time with you. And he, he was talking, he said, moving on to the next point, I'll share how you can redeem that uh, for the gospel and just use it in the Christian community so that we can, we can build each other up. So I think there's so many beautiful things in our cultures in the diversity we've heard today that we can embrace without feeling like th that is something that is anti the gospel, that is something that is not helpful. I think there's so many things in our cultures that are helpful, that can help us bring glory to God, that can help us as well uh, to build each other up and build our nation uh, together. So that's embrace. We spoke about that. Now, I want to talk about redeem. Um, and as we talk about redeem, uh, uh, we spoke a bit earlier, gentlemen. Uh, I'll give you time to think through it. Um, and as we do that, let me, let me share just uh, from my perspective. I think it'll be great uh, to do that as well. So for a very long time, I have thought of the, the practice. I've rejected the practice of initiation um, for a very long time in my life. Um, and I think it started with, um, so growing up in a closer home, uh, my dad was my hero. Uh, now my dad had flaws, like lots of flaws, as I do as a father. But there was just so many things about him, so many things about him that I adored. And I remember when we had first had the conversation that, hey, hey, you would need to go to the mountain to be, to be trained and, and taught how to be a man. My first inclination was, man, I'd like you to teach me what, to be, what, what being a man looks like. I don't understand why I need to go elsewhere. I think that's the first thing I thought. And I think too, I looked at some of the other people who had been there and they weren't the kind of men I wanted to be. Um, and so I looked at my dad and said, I, I'd like you to, to, to actually teach me uh, on what being a man looks like. Um, and for a very long time, he and I went back and forth, uh, became a Christian. And there were particular things I became uncomfortable about um, uh, with just uh, the whole initiation, uh, with the whole practice of initiation. But I think in the last four or five years, I've, I've in one sense changed my mind about things in that uh, what I've come to see is you've got the principle in the Kosa culture that you've got a community that sees it as being important to raise men that you've got a community that comes together and they think this is a priority. We need to raise men. Yes, we can look at some of the men who've come from there and think we don't really agree with how they look like. But I think one guy in college really got me thinking differently about this. He said, because he's respected in those circles, they know him. He actually takes some guys from his church there and he actually spends, the time, spends that time walking them through the gospel. And when he said that to me, uh, it just dawned on me. Here's a beautiful practice in the Tosa culture. We might not agree with many other things that are related to it, but the principle is you've got people that have come together as a community to raise men. And I've just been thinking over and again, how can we in the Christian culture, because this is discipleship, how do we in the Christian culture, you have older men, how can we begin to embrace this more and more so that we have men that see it as a priority to raise men uh, in, in the church or in our society. So that's just an example for me of where I've seen something in my culture that I think is redeemable. And I thought, man, let's see the gospel work through that. Uh, but that's just my story. That's from my side. I'm just going to let the gentlemen as well, whom we've invited, you want to hear from them. 
um, to share what kind of things from their culture they have thought of, of redeeming uh, for the sake of the gospel or through the gospel as well. David, you can go now. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I th- so I think one of the things that um, I think just for my for my side of uh, of the world in South Africa, um, the gospel has has because my community, as I said, it's very much the Catholic Church is one of the big. Yes, there's other churches, Anglican Church is not not that strong not at all, uh, and so. Um, the only gospel, true gospel church that I've sort of, or where I've heard the gospel for the first time expounded was in the Pentecostal church uh, in that community. And they are the closest thing to a, to, to a sound gospel. Um, And so there's a lot just from hearing my story in terms of the the kind of Christianity that we, that is, that has made inroads uh, in that side of, of the world that has, that has caused, um, sort of clashes with the culture, but not to the extent that people has even thought about how that has actually the gospel has actually spoken to the the idols of of the culture. Um, yeah. So, but that said, um, I think one of the things that um, if you think Christian, if you think the history, if you think redeeming renewing, transforming. Um, there's an expression in colored people everywhere, uh, whatever province you go to, it is that we use a funny cop. If, you, if you're familiar with funny cop, they are a online group and they're trying to redeem this word. It's called hum. I don't know if you've heard this word before. Uh, hum. Um, it's G-H-A-M. Uh, they're trying to redeem the word again. And they use expressions like um, funny cop is it's an in, it's organization, a colored organization. And what they're trying to do is, so what they say is with Ham is they, they say, I'm a bitchy sturvy. <laughs> sturvy mean I'm a bit, bitchy, uh, you know, civilized. I'm a bitchy posh. I'm a bitchy that guy, but I'm bitchy Ham as well. So don't get on my wrong side. Ham is the, is the other side. You don't want to touch of me. Uh, you don't want to come here. So colored people know this term very well. Uh, but that term has also... It, it, it has caused a lot, it causes a lot of damage um, with, within the community because Ham is seen as less civil. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, oh, it's the Bushman type thinking. It's the, the bad type thinking and, 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 and really comes from, from the, if you know the doctrine of Ham. Um, it's, so Ham is G-H-A-M. So you take away the G, you end up with Ham. So it comes up with uncivil. You, you uncivil. And so often within where I, in colored communities, uh, I've, I've led, a, I've led a youth ministry there for a very long time. Um, and, and whenever poorer kids come into my youth uh, in, on the Cape Flats, uh, the kids who, who, other kids, you know, who dress a little bit nicer would, would say to the other kids, uh, you know, whenever there's a small fallout, they would call them this name. Oh, but you got, you, 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 you are just this. And I would often lose those kids. Um, as a consequence, because they feel inferior, they feel lesser, and they and it's an inferiority thing that's there. But it's also a very much cultural thing in the in the way that we think of ourselves. That if um that if you are if you are there, you you are this and this and that. So you can see it's very broken. Um, and I have seen actually Christian people uh, trying to redeem um, a lot of that that culture, um, because I think we're also sitting in a culture. That a society that has that has that views um, colored people and people of color in particular uh, a certain way in the way that we express ourselves as less you know as, as, as in that kind of thing, and so I've seen gospel people coming alongside and proclaiming the gospel and redeeming some of some kind of identity, some kind of dignity, some kind of you know goodness that comes from from being a person of color, being made in the image of God, and God is fine with that. Uh, in the way that you express yourself, uh, in the way that you carry yourself, in the way that you dress, in the way that you, whatever you, however you carry yourself. And so that side of it, I think, is, is, has, been, has, been, has, been, has been a positive uh, culturally. 
uh, both in my own discipleship, but I think also discipleship generally in the way I've, I've, I've seen many guys discipling the, the, the churches in that sense. Yeah. Uh, thanks, David. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Johan, um, do you, can you share um, from your side? Yeah, sure. I, I told you that the, the counter narrative to the victimhood narrative is <clears throat> building. And, you know, this is very important to the Afrikaners, to Bo. And, and, and there were some very successful uh, attempts, um, I, I think, historically. So if you think of Sasso, uh, you know, that was a, that came because of all the sanctions against South Africa. And these guys managed to figure out how to make oil out of coal. Um, and I'm no scientist, but I, I guess that's, I think that's what it amounts to. Um, you know, building up things like, like Iskor and just, just, you know, still industrializing what was, uh, you know, a not industrialized country at that stage. Uh, that, that took something and that is, that, that there's something good in that. The, the other thing is that we, we've always had this attachment to the land here in South Africa. You know, we called ourselves the Afrikaner. The way that the, the Afrikaner story was told was very much one of it. This is the promised land that we are entering, which is very dangerous when you become theocratic with your culture, if you uh, conflate that. But uh, yeah, the way we saw it was that we were these refugees from Europe and we got to Africa and we were conquering it a little bit like the Israelites conquered um, Canaan. You know, back in the day, and had to get rid of the tribes and had all sorts of scuffles. And when, when we had a great victory, we would honor God and we would make a, an altar, you know, call it the Fuer Tracker Monument or, or whatever, uh, to celebrate our victories over the, over the locals. And, you know, the Gruwe Track, the Great Trek, is sort of likened to uh, the Exodus. So, so the guys were very clever in how they positioned the story. Um, in a very theocratic way to see that, you know, this is in the new Israel moving into the promised land, etc. Now, a lot of bad came from that kind of thinking to, to always think that you are God's people, God is on your side, is a, it's, it's, it's a very bad idea, um, irrespective of who you are. But um, that's the negative side. The positive side that I think can be redeemed is the fact that there is still a... A, a, a massive attachment to the land. That's why uh, even, even I've got no farmers in my, in, in my family, but when you grow up as an Afrikaner, you pretend to be a farmer. You know, you, you even just, you, you wear khakis, you've never farmed in your life, but, uh, it, and, and that's where the bad fashion sense comes in. But you, 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 you sort of walk around and you pretend to be a farmer because, uh, you, you know, to be a springbok is very high, but if you can be a farmer, you know, you've transcended the springbok, which is second in line of what is, what is great. And, um, and there's something good about that. Well, I just think where, where we need to do some work is are we still as passionate about the land, about building, even when we are not the boss anymore? Because that, that building is good. That passion for the land is good. Um, but we lost a lot of it, um, you know, now that we are not the boss anymore. And it's not all bad. And, and, and look, there's a way in which we must build, because I, I know there are a lot of well-meaning Afrikaners, including myself, who will, you know, run into the township and build stuff and make things, you know, and, and, and end up doing more damage than good. Um, so so then there must be a certain sensitivity and humility in, in the approach and collaboration, absolutely. But that obsession with building, you know, lifting you up, yourself up from the bootstraps, whether it's a fable or not, there's something good in, in that. And there's something good in being very committed towards this southern patch here at the bottom of Africa. Mm. 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 Thanks, thanks, Johan. Uh, uh, I think I'll start with a more sort of in, not, not insignificant, but like sort of something a little bit less significant to, for other people, wh which would be uh, just our cultural artifacts as, as, as Zulu people, uh, whether it would be 
uh, 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 stories, our uh, history, uh, the kingdoms and all of that stuff, whether it could be, uh, you know, the, the clothing, the music, the, 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 all of these things that, you know, we've sort of uh, put aside with regards to beauty and aesthetic uh, that I think uh, right now, if, if those things, we really looked into them well and, and carefully, they, they, they bring a lot into our global world. You know, if, if, if we really worked in with just our art, uh, uh, and now again, as I said, maybe it's like a less significant thing, but I'm just thinking, I mean, like growing up, you, you, or, well, I did, you sort of ran away with everything that resembles your culture uh, aesthetically, you know, your look, your, your, uh, just culturally the way you did things. And I think now it's only back, I mean, I, you know, my wife is involved in a lot of, uh, uh, um, um, uh, what's the word? Design, design. Um, and she's always looking into, and, and the thing is with design, it's always like looking back to look forward. You know, they said trends of what's coming in design coming up, but they look back to that. She said, we're going to go back to the, the 70s are coming back or whatever. There's a sense that you, you drop back from history for, to, for you to move forward. And that happens even in different cultures. Now we're going to do there's a Scandinavian theme that's coming up in, in, in two years' time. And, and now even with regards to African themes, with regards to Zulu themes, that I think there are a lot of things that I've slept on, um, even myself. I mean, looking back and just, I mean, there are so many things you, you see now of whether it's, it's TV stories that, 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 you know, you watch a lot of movies of kingdoms or whatever, but like, I mean, there's just such history that the, the, the Zwede king who built Nongoma uh, or, or the, the, the Mtetwa King, all of these things that, you know, sometimes we don't know, but like they're just rich in, if we put them and put them in our stories today. Um, so like for me, I think, I mean, there are other things that I've really looked into. I mean, Johan is talking about, I think with, with regards to resilience and, and moving forward, uh, there's a sense that uh, Afrikaners and Zulus, there's a sense of similarities there with regards to that aggression on, 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 on things, which is why, I mean, sometimes people talk about Zulu people as, as violent and aggressive. Um, but I think, I mean, there's a certain wrongness with that, but like there's, there's, a, there's a sense of, uh, man, I can do this, I can beat you, you know, they sort of lose a thing like shy type thing. But with that, with that sense, it's like, man, I can, I can be ahead of you, I can go get this. Um, which, which again, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a goodness in that to say you don't want, you know, you, 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 you want to go forward, you want to make sure. So even as a, as, a, as a man, there's a big emphasis on taking care of your family. You need, you, you know, as a Zulu man, you, you take charge, you, you, you look after everyone, you, 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 you know, not just your immediate family, but like just, that's just a cultural thing, you look after everyone. So like my uncles had to sit me down after my marriage, I mean, after, my, after the wedding to say, man, listen, now, you are part of uh, uh, taking care of the family. You know, you, you, it's, it's part of your responsibility and, and you've seen how we've done things. We take care of everyone, not just your own family. So that are things that I think, again, that communal aspect of, of my culture. Yeah, so aesthetic, I think there's a lot there, uh, but also just this communal and resilient aspect of, of my culture, yeah. Amen. Amen. Thanks, thanks for for that. Question. And I think it's these are the reasons why we've we've got to praise God for just the diversity we have in our country. That we can actually not just be learning from our own cultures, but be able to draw from the cultures of others and see how we can actually redeem these things and use them um, uh, in 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 our communities in the church. Now, I think there's, there are particular things that we would uh, immediately disagree with, that we would feel perhaps hamper uh, the spirit of the gospel. So someone asked a bit earlier, what is the gospel? So the way we think of the gospel is, um, one, the gospel is God's message uh, to save uh, his people through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, so we're talking about the forgiveness of our sin. And by sin, 
we refer to not just our wrongdoing, uh, but the very fact that um, all of us are just born uh, with the inclination uh, to, to move away from God. So, so God has redeemed us from that, has redeemed us from, uh, he has saved us from being his enemies. So that's, that's the one aspect of it we talk about. The second is when we talk about gospel as well. Uh, we're talking about the good news, which is what we mean by gospel. The good news is God has broken into our world and he has begun a work of renewing our world. He has begun the work of moving our world towards um, uh, his coming. We would say his coming uh, new creation and this is his new world. So these are the two aspects of it. I hope you you get it in one part. Uh, so in, in short, I would say uh, the gospel is God's, it's, it's grace-centered, it's God's grace towards us, but it's also kingdom-centered. God has brought his kingdom to our world and is beginning to change our world in one sense um but um but uh, there are things that we would all feel um perhaps hamper this there are things that we feel are not helpful in our own cultures uh we look at them and we think um this is not something that does not actually agree with not just the gospel message but what god's kingdom is about uh what god's community this new community is formed that he has formed is about um, what kind of things would you guys, uh, from your own cultures, would, would you say immediately, uh, this is something that, um, that is unhelpful uh, in one sense? Let me go first because I still, I still have this in my, in, in my head. I would say also, again, coming back to myself as maybe a, a husband, um, you know, I, it, it was a big one for me because I mean, I grew up again with my uncles and, 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 and just men around me who taught me a lot of things with my culture and, and, and stuff. Um, and being a Christian, you know, Christianity teaches this seven leadership. You know, you, as much as you lead, you, 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 lead, you lead by laying yourself down by serving, um, which culturally is different. Like for me, it was, man, you're the man of the house you need to get respect, you don't do certain things, you know, this is your role as a man, a woman should be, you know, all of these things that I really had to, to really wrestle with, you know, to say, man, you know, I, I just been walking around with a sense of entitlement in the house, that my wife can't speak to me this way, all of this, because I've never seen that in, in my context, like my uncles, there was just, there was just a very, there was never, they will never touch dishes. Like my, I've never seen him touch dishes. It's, it's not something that he would do. He, he will not touch a nappy. Um, so for me to be able to, you know, I remember, I remember having my, 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 my mother and some other uncles visit the house. And we, our, our two year old was still real young at the time. And man, and, and she was crying and stuff like that. And, and my wife was just like, no love, just, just change him and whatnot. And man, I was just like, oh man, like, I have to save face because I feel like everyone is going to see that I'm changing nappies. And my uncles are going to be like, man, we didn't raise you like this. Um, but it was one of those things that I was like, man, I have to, I, I, there's another story that I'm part of now, you know, the story of, of, of God who has come to serve, uh, who has shown us humility, who, all of this thing that the gospel teaches us that I, I have to be like, wait, actually, I, I think uh, being a husband means this, uh, uh, you know, against what my culture taught me. So there's, pro there's probably just like something I'm just remembering quickly and that's something that I, I had to, to wrestle with, yeah. Mm -hmm. Johan? Yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to bash whiteness at the moment. Uh, it's sort of, you know, part of the political correct thing to do. And, and, and I'm definitely not on that bandwagon you know, of, of what we can call critical theory. So, so let me just get that out of the way. Having said that, uh, there are things in Afrikaner culture that, uh, that, that must just stop, that is just irredeemable. And, and there's something uh, patronizing uh, in, in our approach to many, uh, to many black people in this country. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of Afrikaners are, are confused these days because you've got the middle class and the colleagues coming through, but they're still at a bottom level. I, I say bottom level in terms of uh, the, the type of profession. 
where, where the attitude is not is not good enough and you know we don't we don't we don't see people as as we should see them you know, the, the, the Zulu at, at, and Sichle can correct me, but uh, the way I understand Saul Borna is I see you. And it's as if we, there, there are certain people we just don't see. They are invisible to us. And, um, and, and that's something that, that must change. I, I, I realized this a, a few years ago, that if I, if I see a bunch of um, white, old white ladies standing next to the road, uh, or, or standing on a bus, then I would, it, it would be something that, that would you know, get my attention. But if it's the black equivalent of it, then that happens every day, I drive past it. Or if, if, if I drive past uh, a corner, um, uh, a corner at 12 o'clock at night here in Pretoria, and I see there's a white girl, then I will think one of two things, either she's a prostitute or she needs help. But I drive past, you know, black girls all the time. It doesn't mean that I must stop everywhere and, and help. I'm, I'm just saying that there are certain things that, 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 that we see and other things that we do not see. So um, I, I think that's the one bit, is, is, is to, 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 to see better um, and to stop this. Uh, in Afrikaans, there's a word, bar um, but it's, it, it, it has to do with this patronize, patronizing behavior. And not to look at people um, with with value. So that's that's part of my introspection, um, as as you want. So instead of just talking on behalf of all the Afrikaners, this is something that I had to learn and continue continue to learn. Something else that I that I detest is uh, we've got this complaining um, uh, pandemic. I mean, we think COVID nineteen is a pandemic, but complaining in the Afrikaners is, it's a pandemic and. Um, you know, we, we used to say, if Mandela is out of jail, we're all going to die. And then he got out of jail and we didn't all die. And then he said, no, if he becomes president, we're all going to die. And then he became president and we didn't die. And then we said, if, it is, if he's not president anymore, we're all going to die. Like he went from zero to euro very quickly there. But it's this, this constant um, complaining, you know, looking at the media and saying, yeah, you see, that's, that's what they do with this country. That's what they do. Um, they being black, and, and it's, uh, and, and there's almost a sense of, uh, I, I think, I, I can't speak German, but the German word is schadenfreude, uh, so if you speak German, you probably know I'm an idiot, but apparently the word means you are experiencing a pleasure at the, at the expense or the pain of somebody else, and there's almost something sometimes that I experience that we, uh, we almost get a kick out of the latest corruption allegation. We almost get a kick out of the latest state failure because it's, yeah, you see, you see, of course. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is part of, of a deep, deep introspection that Afrikaners must do. It's a bad way to end this conversation because now you guys are all going to hate Afrikaners. Um, but we, we're like most other sinners in the sense that uh, there's, there's good and bad that's all in, intertwined uh, with each other. But, but those are the two things that seeing people and this constant complaining. Mm. Mm. Thanks, thanks for that, Johan. David? Um, I'd say that there's a, there's a great sense of loss within, within my people as, as, as an ethnic group. Um, a great sense of loss in a sense that um, it's so complex that we are a group of people who are descendants of the indigenous people of of, of, of South Africa and that we are, we, are, we are slaves. Some of our descendants are slaves brought here and we have European uh, blood in us and it's, and it's a mixture of that. And so when you, talk when, you talk, when you talk about culture and ethnic expression through our cultural being, it's, it's, it, it, it becomes, It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story of loss. I feel like there's a lot of loss and hence you have those expressions like, 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 um, like hum, um, because what we, we it's, it's a, it's a trying to be something that is not associated with, with some of the bad that comes with, with us and also what society has told us that we are. And, and I think, yeah, it, 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 it muddies a lot of uh, identity things um, 
Um, and so hence you will, you will often hear amongst colored people whenever uh, black and white speak, whenever ethnic groups are, are having a conversation that we always say, it's, oh, it's the, it's the zebra conversation. We are not part of this conversation. We're not, we're not part of this country. People don't recognize us. We don't, people don't see us because of, because of the, where people pitch the conversation. We, we sort of end up wherever, whatever group goes with. Um, and so we, we find ourselves in this, in this, in this middle and, and, we, and we're having to wrestle with identity things that are not often addressed. Uh, we had a conversation at Yellow Men's uh, uh, Isabel Bano the other day called the Colored Conversation. It went insane from 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 one from 120, 110 people viewing on the day, signing in, watching that thing. Uh, within three three hours, we had something like 2,000 views, uh, and that's mind you, that's you can have 100 views, but then how many people are sitting and watching that? Uh, the country is starved for mm. for what are, what are, what is on their minds? What do they have to say? Um, we are starved for having you know so little. I mean, if you ask anybody who who's the colored people whose voices you hear in the South African conversation, oh, Eusebius, beyond Eusebius, Makaiza, who's the colored writers? Who's the authors? Who the, who the people? You know, and when I think of you know, can we have? Uh, Christian writers, uh, black Christian writers. No, we we in that, but we we not really in that conversation. Um, and so and so, there's a real deep sense of of loss there. And and I think we we feel that loss and we wrestle with that loss um, uh, in in our in our cultural expression, in our, our identity. And so that's something that I grieve about a lot. That's something that I lament a lot. And, uh, but when I turn to the gospel, I see, I see, and I'm with you, honey, here, talking about a, a, a Christian culture is a little bit dangerous because then we, we become nobody because we, oh, when you're Christian, here's your identity. Don't worry about the stuff that you don't have. But then when we're in conversation with, with you, honey, you can trace his ancestry. I can speak to, to Sikhle, he can trace his ancestry, his Zulu, and he can trace his clan. And then I'm sitting there and I'm trying to, figure out oh yeah where I, I can't I can't have that conversation to the fullest extent um, and so and so yeah there's there's that there's that there's that sense of um, identity that sense of being that, that sense of cultural uh, expression in a sense that's 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 lost for us um, and so it, it causes me to yeah so when I reflect on the gospel when I reflect on on what Jesus says and does through the gospel what god says um uh, it gives it gives a sense of it gives a sense of hope in that um my humanity is affirmed in that uh and whatever i have lost as a consequence of the fall i can because christianity is so coherent i can add that to the loss and it's not necessarily my my sin problem but it's the sin of of, of the world and sin of others that has caused some of that loss. And I can make sense of that. And in him, I can, I can, I can see the beauty that is, that is, that is in, 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 in me and, and, and need my people group. And so I can, I can speak to that from a gospel standpoint and I can redeem and, 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 and undo things like the expression, like hum, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can reclaim something of, of my humanity in the gospel that no other philosophy, no other ideology, can can give uh, uh, can give my people, um, and so I just, I just think that's 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 a that's a beautiful thing. I think that the, that the gospel brings. I was sorry, I'm I'm, I'm doing what Sikhle is doing. He goes on a lot. He speaks. I'm I'm gonna do this. But I was I was counseling a a. Look, I I was I was counseling an Afrikaner white student and. Uh, and she was like, you know, I get, I was, when I was a pagan, I dated the Zulu guy. And I tell you, I could just see my father in him because there was a pride and a manliness that I, when I dated an English a white guy, I felt like, man, this guy is a woman. What kind of people are these? I was like, what are you talking about? You guys are all white. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm Afrikaner. I'm an I'm a Afrikaner woman. He's like, but now I'm a Christian. I have to love them too. Shame. I was like, <laughs> but, but, um. But it, 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 it's just that beauty that the gospel brings and, and it, it flipped her thinking, Afrikaner thinking. And I think that, 
that's the beauty that that when I look at Jonah coming to um, coming to Nineveh and he turns that world uh, that 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 those that people upside down, and the way he has to then think of those people as brothers, not just as Ninevites. I think that's that's mm-hmm. a, that's something that that the gospel has has definitely given given my people in the way that we now trying to appropriate those of us who are really trying to do the work appropriate ourselves and our our being as a people um, within this conversation the South African conversation that I think that is very unique for us uh, is very unique in that we can say oh but we we are we are black oh but we but we but we want to be careful because we're not truly completely black yeah we identify some some cultural blackness in us as as me as some of the stuff that I exp- explained to you in 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 the way you know my people in the northern cape express themselves but there's something unique in that uh, it's also a tragedy in that we were so you know we are so trying to undo oh, i'm not bushman i'm not that that's that's primitive that's primitive i'm not ham i'm not that there's, there's a tragedy in that but there's also a, 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 a despite all of that stuff there's also a gospel sense the gospel came in and the gospel and is trying to wrestle with us in as we wrestle with Jesus in trying to see where we end up and where we where we where we land up in this conversation. And that's only because and I'm speaking about people who are doing the work. Other people you come to Western Cape, you'll hear some yeah, well other people having to wrestle with that question of identity and belonging in the South African context of colored people in a in a very tragic, sad, sad way. Mm. 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 Thanks, thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks, Jess, just for your, for your honesty today. Um, it's good to learn just of the different cultures in our, in our country. And it's wonderful to see uh, that God has gifted our country and has blessed us with such, such diversity and that we can learn so much from each other, uh, so much that can help us in, in our work with him. And I think there's much that we can celebrate in terms of God's common grace to our different uh, cultures. And... Um, but much more we can celebrate his goodness, uh, the good news uh, that through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has made a way uh, to take people who are far from him, uh, which is all of us. Um, and he has brought them close. Uh, but we also know that uh, he's also begun not only bringing us together, but he's also started building his kingdom, building this new community in which we celebrate our diversity, um, but our diversity under him. Um, as our king. So uh, I'm glad that you guys have joined us today. Uh, we are um, right on time to finish. I'll pray for us if you've got questions. Um, uh, the, the panelists will stick around to answer those questions. But thank you for joining us. And, and I'm hoping that in the coming week you will think, um, you'll think of just uh, of, of speaking to someone that's from a different culture and figure out what you can learn from their culture. Uh, learn that is uh, something that are from their culture that is worth embracing. Uh, that is redeemable and uh, and as well that we think is irredeemable. But obviously the first two being very important. And um, and also that you would start looking at your own culture and start thinking uh, what things in my own culture can I embrace? Uh, what things are redeemable and what are not? Um, and I actually believe uh, these kind of things would, would aid us in a great way uh, in evangelism and trying to reach out to our families uh, when, when they realize that there's so much in, in our cultures that uh, that is God given so much in our cultures that is good. Uh, so so please consider doing that in this coming week, especially as we do as we're in Heritage Month. Uh, think about these things. Let me let me pray for us, and then uh, you, uh, whoever sticks around can stay around uh, for for questions. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your common grace uh, that we see your blessing uh, on every culture uh, in the world. Uh, We see how you have not left us to ourselves, um, how you uh, have continued to sustain even uh, those who do not know you, um, those who who are far off from you. And Lord, would you help us to really celebrate uh, the the goodness we see in our cultures, Uh, help us to embrace what we see as being good, Uh, help us to redeem uh, what can be used uh, for the sake of your kingdom, and Lord, help us to be careful that uh, the things that do not honor you, uh, the things that would, um, would bring shame to the gospel, that we are able to uh, simply um, uh, walk away from those. Much more, Lord, we pray that you would uh, really help us to, in celebrating our diversity, to do it 
under the kingship of Jesus, who has made us one new humanity, one new community that learns from each other, that celebrates each other, uh, and that celebrates especially um, um, the, the fact that you are moving us uh, towards uh, your new creation. And Lord, would you be with us in the coming week? We do pray. Amen.